So I came to Nottingham in 1980 to do a physics degree and uh, worked through that. But towards the end of it, I got very interested in uh, computing. And in fact, I ended up doing physics with computing. That's where I met Dave and uh, the other people who were setting up the uh, early computer science group. And then he said, after I'd finished that, oh, I've got a bit of spare money. Uh, would you like to work on some typesetting stuff? Uh, there's, there's all sorts of interesting things happening. Uh, so I did. I worked on that for a year, I think, with Dave, uh, doing various things, including this uh, connection for the exams machine and all that interesting stuff. Never mind, said Julian, quite rightly. He said, we'll keep the lower level of RAM for that. And then I got really interested in networking as, as that was just starting to come about. And uh, I worked with another lecturer called Hugh Smith. Uh, and he had contacts with UCL. And so we got into this sort of internet and ARPANET and early connections to that. And I started working on um, email software to try and make sense of all this stuff that was going on, get rid of all these exclamation marks in your roots and things like that, and uh, just try and make it simpler. Well, it was quite early on, so it was about 1984 or 3, I think I got involved in it. At that time, the, the internet was, well, it was all just ARPANET, so it was the uh, uh, American connection. And we had a very, very tenuous connection. We had some friends at University College London, and they had a satellite link to the ARPANET that they'd had for a while. And we were in the maths building, which is what we are today. And we didn't actually have a connection to the outside world, but psychology did. So you could connect across to psychology's computer, and dial up London, log into one of London's nodes, and then you could use the internet, um, very, very slow, and of course, it was going across satellite. So you connect to, I don't know, there weren't very many sites, but there were a few places you could pick up software. So you, you'd log into those. But because it was going over a satellite, you, you type like a letter A, and it would take about three seconds for the A to come back. And, and so you'd start typing, and then you'd get very confused halfway through and have to delete it all. And this was all painfully slow, but we thought it was wonderful at the time. So it was about you know, 20 minutes or something to get onto the internet from here, but, but we did manage it. Alongside that at the same time was uh, sort of a more anarchic network called uh, Usenet, which uh, was just, that was machines that you were friendly with, you talked to other machines and, and a whole grouping came out of that. So we also had that, so you, you could use that alongside it. So you could sort of send email to somebody and say, do you know a good site I can go to to pick up software for? this, that or the other, and they'd send something back over that. But it was all very, very uh, uh, disconnected. So I remember we connected to Lancaster, and then Lancaster connected to Kent, and Kent connected to Amsterdam, and Amsterdam was the European gateway. They could then connect. And at the very early stage, you actually had to work out your route. So if you wanted to email somebody, you'd say, right, so go from Nottingham to Lancaster to Kent to Amsterdam to Seismo to Rutgers to something other, and you could eventually work out where to go and how it would get there. So it was oh, so much fun. We had email in the department for a long time, and then as psychology and other places got connected, we, we sent it around campus. I can't think who I would send the first one to, probably somebody at University College London, because we did a lot of work with them early on and eventually had some uh, connection, which is how we got connected to the internet. Uh, I do remember <coughs> desperately trying to get in contact with Brian Kernigan and sending email after email along these different paths, so you know, via Amsterdam and Seismo to, it was called Research, Research. And everybody's name was just their computer name, so Research was the AT&T computer node. So, and eventually, I remember, I think it was late on a Friday night, I was watching the logs and suddenly saw an email come in. It was from Brian. I rushed down to Dave Brailsford and said, look, look, we've got connection. Look, here's the route that you need to use. And he scribbled it down. And from then on, we had contact. Uh, very soon after that, we started sort of collaborating. So I was working with somebody in the California. And we were working on software that uh, got switched around. So I'd be working on it during UK time, and then he'd be working on it Californian time, and then he'd send me changes. And uh, yeah, it was, that was mostly done over email. We didn't need very much uh, because in the UK we were still 
we weren't using TCP IP, we were, uh, we were told we had to use X25 at the time. But we cheated and we ran sort of TCP over X25 and we ran strange protocols that allowed us to connect to the internet. And we did actually even manage to have a sort of talk system where you could type a message and it would appear in California and, and vice versa. That was a great day when that first happened. I guess that was about 1986 or seven when that, uh, we managed to cobble together enough protocol to get that all to work. And you mentioned email. The instant thing you think of these days is probably webmail or a client with mm -hmm. email, um, with attachments just being dealt with for you. Oh, could, you could, can you, you talk me through that? You couldn't do attachments at all, no. You, you could uh, sometimes, because it was all just text, so sometimes you could wrap them up in interesting ways. And um, there, there was a particularly one self-extracting, it was called a Shar archive, self-extracting. It was actually a small shell script program for Unix. and so your message arrived and you just ran the contents of the message as a program and it extracted itself and you could send files that way. But that was fairly late on because we had very little bandwidth at the time so it was more very short emails and uh, this is a place to pick up a file from. You try and get the file somewhere near, nearer to the person so that they could pick it up with a reasonable speed. So this is a message I've saved from 1987. And this is the path you can see here. So it starts off over here. This is the person. And then this is all the places it's been through. So Seismo was a popular place in, I think it's in Virginia or somewhere like that. But it had great connectivity to lots of other places. And then down here we have the MCVAX, which is the European node. And then it, and then it trickles across the UK to get, get to us from here. So you know, that was kind of one of the early messages and you had to remember these paths and write them down so that you, you could get back to them. And this is kind of the, the route it took. It jumped around in Europe a little and then leapt over across the uh, Atlantic and then rattled around there until it ended up where it went to. And this is just a, this is the satnet that was. So this bit here is all the US. Then there's a connection here coming over the satellite to Goon Hilly down in Cornwall, then a landline up to UCL. I remember when they finally got to upgrading that, they went to a transatlantic cable. There was something called TAT8 or TAT6, transatlantic telephone cable 6. When that was laid down, suddenly we had more bandwidth than we ever knew what to do with. Until about two months later when we fully utilised it all. So that's the way it goes. That was what a lot of the internet was for. I mean, that's still what the internet's for, actually serving very little purpose. But you know, back then, they took it to a, to a different level. And we'd have to go into this really dark room, and the computers were green little... I had an Amiga computer, right? This is like an um, Amiga 500.